Hello and welcome to episode 42 of the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. I'm your host, David Holloway, and it's great as always to be here with you. And once again, I'm joined by the amiable and sublime Paul Bindig. How are you, Paul? I'm great. Thanks, David. Wonderful to be here again. And look, I know I said this last time, but I'm just going to say it again because this is still new. I can see you. It's so exciting. And listeners, you you may not realise that, that David and I live how far apart do we live? So, yeah, between Adelaide and Sydney, uh, well, I'm south of Sydney, but it'd be if you're in a car, it'd have to be 12 hours drive. Yeah, I, I think it's a bit more than that, David. I, I, I think it might be, uh, I have driven to Sydney from Adelaide, but it's been a while. I, I reckon it might be something like 16 hours straight. Wow, yeah. It, it's, it's a long way. And so, yeah, our uh, for, for all of our listeners, David and I, we, we've, we rarely get to see each other. We've always done this voice to voice. So it's very exciting to be able to see you and hear you, David. And my goodness, you're a handsome gentleman. Oh, look, yeah. What can I say? Except I'm the, um, what's the old saying? I'm the, it's not the shit in the sandwich. It's the other one. Anyway, I'm the, I, you're, you're the rose between one thorn. It's rose between two thorns. So I shouldn't have tried that analogy because it just doesn't work. Oh, it was funny hearing you try. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, yeah, we're back. It's great to be back. And um, uh, thank you to those that have already provided feedback on, on the new format for those uh, watching via video. As I've said prior, we, we're still continuing to release it as an audio podcast and we'll always do so. I know that's how so many people like to use it. We don't all have the luxury of just watching. Um, so this, this is our um, episode where we talk to Jim Danica. And now Jim is an amazing guy who, who manages to sort of hold three lives. He, he does some incredible touring playing with some um, artists that you'll hear in a moment um, that, that is really interesting to hear about. He also uh, runs as a sideline a business selling some incredible sounds that can be used on Logic main stage and um, soon to be um, contact or native instruments format as well. And then when he can fit it in, he does other pieces of work as far as supporting other artists, producing other artists, um, a little bit of film and TV work and so on. Just a, a well-rounded guy that manages to have a, a lot of balls in the air that he's juggling and, and pulls them all off. So, um, yeah, looking forward to um, speaking with Jim, Paul. Yeah, I can't wait. I'm really fascinated how he manages to balance all these things. But uh, for, for our patreon subscribers we we have a very exciting piece of bonus content where we're going to dive right into his his uh, main stage sound creation and he's, he's done some wonderful stuff with 80s music and you know david you and i we're um we're gen x and we we love these sounds so i'm really looking forward to just picking his brain on on where that all came from and, and how it's going for him so lots to look forward to i can't wait no, let's do it. So let's jump in and have a chat to Jim now. Hi, Jim. I can't thank you enough for joining us. And I know it's a relatively decent hour for you mid-afternoon, So, but still appreciate you jumping in. You got it. Happy to. Um, and I, as I said just before we started recording, very disappointing. You don't have any keyboards in the background. I think you need to do better <laughs> next time. <laughs> I'll, I will try. <laughs> So, um, yeah, look, uh, we're really keen to talk to you, obviously, about your um, incredible career um, as a keyboard player. So um, just to probably start off, just tell us a little bit about yourself. What, what through your, you know, developmental years got you to a stage that music has become a passion and now a full-time career for you? Well, it probably all goes back to seeing Star Wars when I was, how old was I? Four years old. <laughs> 1977 um from that first you know opening title crawl i just it's funny my parents tell me that i had an ear infection we were on vacation and they just they saw the ad for it and thought Look, we got to get this kid to forget about his ear infection so they took me to see star wars and i mean i, I must have forgotten about it because that was you know one of the defining moments of my life and so I grew up on a steady diet of John Williams and, you know, in film music, but at the same time, um, you know, in the eighties synthesizers, I mean, the DX seven came along and revolutionized everything. And so I'm just, I was a child of the eighties, you know, any, anything from that decade, I just absolutely love that slick pop, you know, production. So half and half, you know, it was a steady diet of film music on one hand and then eighties pop on the other hand, anything that was on the radio, um, and then around, I guess it would have been 1987, I think it was, 80, 80, 
no, 88. Uh, I saw uh, Amy Grant uh, for the first time live and her keyboard player at the time, he it was kind of a co-bill, a guy named Michael W. Smith. He was her musical director and keyboard player and he did the first half of the show. And seeing that the production and um, everything about it, the guy who was the front of house engineer, this was, a, it was a big arena show. He was as much a part of that show as anybody, it, at least, you know, if you're into sound and, and, you know, production, he just had a way of mixing it. And, and it was a very keyboard heavy show. And I, I was just mesmerized. I mean, hearing that kind of, you know, it was all super Jupiters and, you mm. know, Yamaha TX 816 and all these big synth layers mixed with great songs it, it just it captivated me and I, I just knew that night that was i'll never forget it. it was september 27th 1988 I, that's what i'm going to do with my life and um whatever it is seven eight years later i moved to nashville uh and six years six months after that i was working for michael and that was 26 years ago so that's the short version of the story yeah so, so. how how did the uh the working with Michael come about, Jim. So obviously you moved to Nashville well, six months later. You're working with him. How did that? How did that occur? How did you get the gig? Yeah, it's well, it's it's a long story, but the short version is kind of what I just told you. I, I just there was something about his music that I really connected with purely on a musical level. I just loved his approach to pop songwriting. He he's mm -hmm. a phenomenal pop songwriter, and um, you know that mixed with the synth stuff it just it's almost like you know when you hear somebody else's music and you think gosh if i would i could have written that you know yeah. it, not not in terms of i'm, I'm that good but mm -hmm. it, there's something about it and and Resonance. so it all through my teen years um he was just probably you know one of the artists i listened to the most at the time along with the pop radio stuff and i just thought man it, it would be awesome to work with him someday and so uh, after I graduated high school, um, you know, my parents made me promise that I would try going to college. But, you know, I I didn't make it for, through the first week before I knew that this was not for me. And I, I ended up doing a whole first year, but I was paying for it. My parents couldn't afford to send me to college. And and so I kept my promise that, that I would at least try it. But it just didn't last long. Yeah. So I ended up working at a music store and. Uh, that was very helpful because I was able to buy a lot of gear at dealer cost. And the uh, problem was I ended up buying more gear than I was selling. I was a terrible salesman. <laughs> and um, so, but it, it was, it was a great thing though, because for that year and a half that I did that, I learned a lot, learned a lot about gear. I got a lot of hands-on time with every new keyboard that came out. So um, fast forward to 1995, I just knew it was time to go. I, I knew that, um, that Nashville was the place I needed to be to work with the artists that I wanted to work with. And so I just started sending, you know, demos and, and resumes and stuff to, to Michael's management office. And wow. um, lucky for me, there was a company out of LA who had just gone out of business and that company serviced all the huge tours, you know, Michael Jackson and Madonna and uh, Michael and Amy Grant. Those were two of the, the Christian pop artists who were also, um, clients of theirs. So it all just worked out. It was the perfect time. That company went out of business and I was sending these resume, you know, and, and demo packages into his, his office. And so they just called uh, about six months after I moved to Nashville and they said, we need somebody, um, you know, Pro Tools had just come out. Yep. The very first version was very primitive, but we need somebody that can build this elaborate system to run the show and i was 22 years old they didn't know me from anybody but they gave me a extraordinary shot and um so the first year with him uh that's what i did i built this huge keyboard rig and and yeah. uh and it ran the it ran that tour and then the following year when it came time to start touring again i just i called michael and i said hey look you know i can play because uh, when he would um this was still in his big pop part of his career Yep. He was so busy all the time. He couldn't come to sound check. So because I grew up on his music, I could fill in for him. <laughs> and so it just kind of, it was kind of like playing chess, you know, uh, just putting all the pieces in place. So, so when the opportunity came, I was ready for it. And, um, 
and he Michael gave me a great chance and and we've grown to be great friends and and um, but yeah that was that was 26 years ago that's that's an amazing story Jim as you mentioned you were only 22 at the time and yeah and he, he obviously put a lot of faith and trust in you giving you yeah. that chance well, yeah. was there any I'm sure he didn't just say hey Jim we've got this massive tour can you run it uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure there was some sort of a bit of a feeling out process and sure you showing him what you could do and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it, yes and no. Um, mm -hmm. I had to go and interview with uh, his tour manager who was, <laughs> he was this, this big Italian guy. It was almost like interviewing with somebody from, from the mafia. <laughs> he, <laughs> he sat, he even sat in this dark corner of Michael's office. It's like, we, we joke that I couldn't see his face and, and, he, he basically just sat there. It was very intimidating. And he said, are you sure you know what you're doing? Because this is a big deal. And that was basically it. And I had to put, put it on the line. And I said, say, yes, I, I do. And I, I knew that I could do it, but there was a lot of, uh, okay, I'm really going to have to go to school in a short time. And so I went out and bought my first Mac laptop and I worked probably 18 hours a day, just absorbing myself in software. And um, I, the fun part was I got to inherit this room full of gear that had just come off of their previous tour. And it was like, this was the moment I was born for. I, I got to take it all apart and, and build it back the way I wanted to and wire it. And, but I tell you what, it, it was uh, rehearsals for that tour were six weeks. Yeah. And the band would come in from 10 to six every day. And then I would start working. I would have to run, you know, rehearsals. But when they would leave, I would work until probably one or two in the morning, just programming, you know, all the stuff that yeah. they had worked on that day. So I didn't get much sleep. Um, but when you're young, you know, you can get away with that. Yeah. And, and I guess uh, you're doing something you really wanted to do, too. It's a yeah. dream job, right? Yeah, it was. Yes. It was like winning the lottery for me. I mean, it, it you know, it just. I really, really feel like I was born to do it. And, and yeah. it, it just, that's a big part of it. You know, that I forget the quote uh, opportunity meets preparation or whatever. And, yeah. you know, every, everything just happened all, all at the right time. I was in the right place at the right time. And it was, um, I, you know, my brief college career, I, I spent every bit of that just drawing keyboard rigs in my notebook, you know, like what would I do if I got a, a big tour and, and, um, Somewhere I still have those notebooks, but it, it's <laughs> it's fun to look back and like, you know what, for whatever reason, God picked me and and I, I'm very, very grateful because it, it was a huge, huge opportunity and it, it led to a, you know, an amazing adventure as far as a career goes. And, and Jim, um, so, Jim, do you have a 22 year old now when you tour with with Michael that, that does all the hard work as far as that, <laughs> that side of things goes? You know what? Yeah, there, there's in fact, we just on this past tour, we finished the fall and Christmas. Um, we, we hired a new uh, backline tech. He's basically a guitar guy. But all these years later, I really still do all my own tech stuff I, just because I enjoy it. Um, you know, I, I come in every day and wire up my rig. And, and I suppose part of it is because I'm extremely OCD and I don't know if I trust anybody to do it <laughs> the way I want it done. Um, so that's, you know. I don't know if that's a character deficiency on my part, but it is what it is. I, I still enjoy doing my own stuff. And um, I take a lot of pride in, in, you know, being meticulous, but also it's, it's my job to make sure that the show runs flawlessly. And so for that reason alone, I, I just, I like to do it myself. Um, yeah, they, yeah. They'll physically set everything up, you know, so I'll come in and everything is there, but I wire it and I, tested every day and you know uh, I also carry the laptop with me so there, there's that part of it you know? okay and we're definitely going to talk rigs later on Jim too so I'm, I'm keen to hear what you, you use on stage now but uh -huh. we'll, we'll get to that and so am I mistaken that you did work or still do work with Amy Grant as well yes um, but only uh, once a year on average we do a Christmas tour uh, most of the year Actually, I should say it this way. On average year from Michael is about 90 shows. Um, right. Some years a little bit more, some a little less. But most years, um, we end up doing a Christmas tour with Amy. Michael and Amy, they're kind of both the, um, they're the icons of Christian pop music. They've been you know, doing it the longest and everybody knows who they are. And uh, so they team up and it's still a magical combination. When 
uh, when they get together, it's it's a phenomenal show. And uh, you know, when it's not when when COVID's not in the picture, it's usually a symphony show. And so it's a big production. Um, this year, the the one we just finished was the first time we did it without an orchestra. So that was interesting. You know, it was mm. just a, a band and and vocal section, and it was great. But uh, yeah, yeah, she's she's a gem. She's fantastic to work with. She is, and and so and for those that aren't as aware of contemporary Christian music as others, can because I even growing up, although I, I've not I'm not a huge listener of, of CCM. Amy Grant was a huge influence on me, and some of her early work, some of the work she did was just superb. Yeah, and I still yeah. I still play it today. Can, mm-hmm. can you explain to our wider audience just what what uh, behemoths both Michael and, and Amy are as far as what they've achieved over the last 35 or so years? Uh, yeah, I can try. I mean, they. It, it's funny you say that because despite the fact that I've worked with them for all these years, um, especially Michael as his musical director, the funny thing is I don't really listen to, to much CCM. Um, it I did as a teenager. My dad was a pastor, and so certainly I grew up in the church. But um, like I said earlier, my, my loves were film music and pop music. But for whatever reason, you know, I, well, purely musical, I think. When, when Michael and Amy came along uh, in the early 80s, now Amy started a little bit before him, I think maybe 1979, 1980, somewhere in there. The thing that really was unique about them is they came along, you know, Christian music before them was very traditional church. You know, you think Mm -hmm. somebody's grandmother and an organ, Um, you know, but actually in the late 60s, there was uh, there's actually a documentary that just came out about this um, a few months ago called I think it's called the Jesus music. It's actually really good. Rolling Stones called it the rock documentary of the year. And it's it kind of gives you a background of how it all developed in in California in the 60s. Um, These a lot of hippies had a spiritual experience and that that kind of was the birth of the whole thing. And so through the 70s, it was very much, um, you know, a lot of, you know, West Coast, California, hippie rock, essentially. And Amy came along and, you know, had this idea that, well, you know, I want to do pop music. And so, you know, she would tell you her influences were James Taylor and, you know, a lot of the music that she grew up on in the 60s and 70s. But she just decided to do this pop thing, and it did really, really well. And um, so she's probably more known than Michael is. Most people, you know, when you say Amy Grant, they, they at least know who she is. Mm-hmm. Around 1984 or five, I think she started having success on secular pop radio. And then she really hit it big around 1987 or 88, I think. Uh, I forget which record it was. There was one called Unguarded. Uh, there was Lead Me On, and um, she started doing duets. Like she did a, a big duet with Peter Cetera, uh, which was I think was on the second Karate Kid soundtrack. And so she started getting noticed on pop radio a lot. And and by the early '90s, she had completely crossed over to where she would still call herself a, a, a faith-based artist, Christian artist, whatever you want to call it. Um, but she just developed a huge following. Mm-hmm. And then Michael same time uh because he was hired as her keyboard player and musical director he toured with her for those first couple tours and then around the the mid 80s he started having a lot of success as well and uh probably around 19 trying to think when it was 1991 he had his big pop hit which was called place in this world and that was i think it hit number four on billboard and um so he had a good couple years there as well of you know regular pop radio but um you know they they still they've done all kinds of things they and I, was about to say, I think you raised a good point there jim about doing all sorts of things and going back to your grandmother on an organ viewpoint that they were yeah. different and it wasn't just a matter of three or four chord songs right there were songs that had quite a bit of complexity and variety and and yeah. look to, to this day jim one of my exercise tracks is ageless melody uh medley sorry off um off the greatest hits album, I think of Amy yeah. Grant. It's one of the coolest songs. Just yeah. love it. It's got it's got rock guitars. It's got right. more classical start with the harpsichord. It's got everything. Yeah. It's yeah. just great. Yeah, it's. I think a lot of people, you know, when I talk about Michael and they go and check him out if they've never heard of him, they're shocked because, again, he he is a brilliant pop songwriter. And there's a lot of 
there's a lot of uh, influences in his stuff. I mean, you can definitely hear his Beatles influences, um, but, you know, vocally, Nick Kershaw, um, certainly a lot of the same 80s stuff that I loved, you know, Phil Collins, Genesis. He has a song on his Change Your World record called Cross of Gold, which is one of the most musically uh, fun things. I mean, there's so many, but very progressive pop rock you know, constantly changing time signatures, key signatures. He can change keys like nobody I've ever heard. He just does these amazing like chord progressions that are just mind blowing. I mean, I've been in the room with him when he's writing and it's, it's not fair because <laughs> you're like, how does one guy have all these amazing ideas? And uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's amazing. He's just an incredible talent. And I wish new more people knew about his, um, his pop writing, so. Yeah, it's, it, it is amazing music. And I, I really encourage our, our listeners slash viewers now to go and check out uh, some of this music. It is, is absolutely yeah. fantastic. And there is a yeah. lot of complexity to it if, if you haven't had a chance. And yeah. on that subject, uh, Jim, looking at some of the concerts that, um, that, that Michael's done and, you know, the big ones with Amy as well, there's, there's a lot going on, as you've said, uh, orchestras and a lot of moving parts that have to be organized how, how do you go wrangling all that as music director particularly when you're dealing with live orchestras and conductors and, and this sort of thing that's obviously adding a, a fair bit of complexity to your role yeah well uh for those specific things when we do the christmas concert with an orchestra uh, for that show, we bring in a, a longtime friend of michael's uh and mine a guy named david hamilton who is um he is Nashville's John Williams. He, he's an yeah. orchestrator and arranger. He, he is one of the most gifted people I know. And he is the guy that's orchestrated all of Michael's instrumental albums. So when you know, I think he's done three or four and they're purely orchestral. In fact, they were done at, um, except for the first one, they were all done at Abbey Road in London with the London Philharmonic or the mm -hmm. London Session Orchestra. And David has done all those orchestrations. So David will come in and essentially I hand over my role to David for that, for the Christmas yeah, tour, because it's, it's, that lets me concentrate on the band. I'll still handle the kind of the administrative part of that. I'll make sure that, you know, I'll get charts or whatever from David and make sure that the rest of the band gets them. And I'll still do all the, the programming and the technical side of it. Mm -hmm. um, actually building the computer stuff, the, you know, clicks and stems, whatever. Uh, but David is the one who kind of spearheads that that tour when we have an orchestra involved because that's like you said it's a lot of moving parts you've got oh, absolutely to, you yeah. know, interface with the every local city's uh orchestra their librarian and it, it's a massive massive amount of work so we kind of tag team on that yeah nice so, nice yeah yeah and you nearly need two of you to tag team to pull that off it sounds like yeah so, yeah 100 yeah. yeah. um and another artist i want to ask about jim that you've uh, worked with is Paul, and I apologize if I've mispronounced his name, Paul Cardall? Cardall, yeah. Cardall, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Um, is, has that been a different sort of experience for you as well as far as uh, your involvement and what you do? Yeah, that, that kind of was a surprise. Um, I'm trying to think how to explain that one. Uh, I had done, um, in 2016, I took a year and a half off uh, from everything other than Michael and decided to do an instrumental album of my own. It's something I wanted to do my whole adult life and I never had a chance, but um, I don't know if you guys know what Kickstarter is. It's a, it's a crowdfunding it uh, mm -hmm. platform. Um, I just got to the point where I thought, okay, I've got enough raw material sitting around over the, over the years, but I wanna do it big. I wanna hire an orchestra and, and, and orchestrate it myself and as if I was scoring a film, but you know, to do that, it's expensive. And so I, th the way I did that was I did a Kickstarter campaign and, you know, it, thankfully it, it worked. Uh, I was able to raise the money that I needed to do it. So I took, it ended up being about two years actually to do that whole album. And um, as I was finishing it, uh, Paul got in touch with me and turns out he was a huge fan of Michael's and he wanted to do a similar project. He wanted to do a, a big orchestral Christmas album um, and he, so the way he tells it to me is he wanted to get in touch with whoever produced Michael's stuff. 
And uh, so he, he contacted me and, and we met. And um, funny thing is, I had no idea who Paul was. Uh, come to find out, he's one of the biggest names in um, piano music, just solo piano albums. He, um, he's done extraordinarily well. He, at the time, I think he had over 2 billion streams on Pandora alone that year. So he's massive and I had no idea. <laughs> So I agreed to do his, his project as soon as I finished mine. And so I ended up doing that one. That took about, that was a year actually uh, in and around other things, but it was fun because it, it was the first time that somebody else had hired me to really take on a big project like that. Mm -hmm. And we, we went to Ocean Way studio here in Nashville and hired the uh, Nashville string players. And um, the rest of it was all programmed. I programmed the whole record. Uh, all the orchestral parts, except for solo instruments. I've, I always bring in a, I've got a friend who I have do solo violin parts. And uh, I brought in a couple solo instrumentalists like uh, a guy named Steve Patrick, who's a big trumpet player here in Nashville. Uh, a few solo woodwind parts, but other, other than that, it was all, I programmed it all other than the string section. So, and Paul's great. He's become a good friend and, and uh, it was a fun project. So, yeah, and he's, he's very successful from, from what I can tell, too. Uh, multiple yeah, he's, yeah, yeah, he's, he's done great. Um, he's won, I don't remember if he's, I don't think he's won a Grammy, but he was not, I think he was nominated for one. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that project that we did together was it was in the running, but uh, I think it fell just short of being nominated. But it it debuted on nine billboard charts at the same time, which is, as wow. far as I know, has never happened before. Congratulations, so it, it, it did well. So, you, you mentioned to us earlier, Jim, that uh, I think you said it was your four-year-old self who was in, inspired by the, the opening strains of John Williams in the yeah. cinema. Yeah. And you've, you've been able to carve out a, a, a really good career for yourself in film and TV work as well. Yeah. How, how did that come about? Well, I, you know, it's funny. I thought that I wanted to be a film composer for a long time because I was so immersed in film music and mm -hmm. probably in the mid 2000s I think it was 2000 well somewhere in there I forget I scored my first film in it was right, right around 2001 I think and it was just a small independent film um, in the meantime I was helping Michael he had gotten a, a couple film scoring jobs and so I would do some stuff for him and um it just one thing led to another. And around 2006 or seven, I started getting asked to submit uh, trailers for Hollywood films. And the funny thing is I would, I would get as close as number two. Um, the last couple I did, uh, one of them was for Transformers. I think one of the Transformers sequels. Uh, so that one went straight to Steven Spielberg. Um, there was a few Disney films, but I never got number one I, I would always get to number two the problem was I live in Nashville you know and the film world is in LA and I have no desire to live in LA so I think <laughs> that may have had something to do with it you know they're they're not going to hire somebody that's not you know nearby and so yeah. for whatever reason they kept asking to, for my stuff and um so you know the proverbial it was an honor to be asked but uh fast forward a few years I did a feature film for a, for a guy who's become a good friend and uh, it was a great learning experience. That was in 20, 2010, I think. But that made me realize that it is an extraordinary amount of work. And um, it, it taught me that it's not something I wanna do full time. It's, you know, exclusively. So um, I did enough of it to realize that it's, it's fun on occasion, but, um, it, it, if I, you kind of have to do it or not do it. And I just decided if I were going to score films again, it would have to be something that was so undeniably the right thing at the right time. And so I've kind of stepped away from it for a while. Um, I'll still do some smaller things, some documentaries or whatever, but um, the last several years have just not really allowed for it. I, I haven't, you know, I'll get an offer sometimes for stuff. I've just turned it all down because it's, um, I haven't found anything that really feels like it's the right thing. You know, if you're going to do it, you, it, James Newton Howard did a documentary or a 
some kind of interview, I forget what it was, a few years back. And it was, it was one of the best descriptions of being a film composer. He talked about how every day for six weeks straight, he would wake up or he'd start at nine in the morning and he'd work until nine o'clock at night. So 12 hours straight. Then he would hand it over to an orchestrator and then a copyist. And, it, you know, 24 hours later, they're playing the, the parts on the, you know, that were written 24 hours before. And it, it made me realize, you know what, you have to be so, so immersed in it. You have no other life. And, and very few people are cut out for that. And bottom line is I need to sleep. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've got to get at least eight hours sleep or I can't function. Yeah. And those guys, they, they just do it at a level that, um, you know, look, I love my family too much and I love my life too much. It's just not something that, that, uh, I don't know how to say. I think you know, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think yeah, I think I think logistically yeah. it wouldn't work for you if you, even you know if you're yeah. doing 80, 90 shows a year plus or your other work we're going to talk about later, you just physically couldn't make it work. Right, right. That that's it. I mean, it's it's not that I'm close to it. I mean, I I love scoring, but I've found that um, because I have such a short attention span, I think that's the other thing. Yeah, I, I've learned about myself that. I can't stand having things hang over me for long periods of time. It just drives me crazy. And so I, I got to thinking, you know what? It's a lot more fun to just do a, a trailer once in a while because it's a three minute piece of music and then it's out of your life. Hmm. And you can do that in a day, you know? And it, it just allows me to do stuff that I really, really love to do. And so maybe someday, you know, I, I, I love film music as a medium. I listen to it all the time. Um, but it's just, it's been a while since something has come across my desk that, that makes me feel like I need to give up everything else in order to do that. So. And, and you, but you've also mentioned you're immersing yourself and, and let's talk about your album at Alter mm -hmm. uh, for a minute. So, I mean, I, I listened through it a couple of times um, in the last couple of days and I absolutely loved it. So you, you did obviously, you know, devote yourself, as you said, aside from Michael to recording that album what what was your approach and sorry just one other comment when I listened to it I thought knowing your plug-in and, and technical back I thought Jim has done an amazing job with things like Spitfire audio plugins and stuff all those strings then realized that you actually had an orchestra record a lot of it so just talk, talk to us uh, that's how you know impressive it sounded um, talk to us about the process of doing that album well um, the long and short of it is it's something I wanted to do my whole life and when I look back, I realized that every time I thought I was ready, I wasn't ready. Um, from a creative standpoint, you know, it, hindsight is always 2020. And all those years I thought, okay, I'm ready to do this, but I didn't have the material. I had scraps. I had a lot of scraps of ideas that it's, many of which made it onto that album. But it took going through an utter hellish period of life to have anything to write about. You know, they, they say that uh, the best art is born out of pain. And for me, that's, that's so the case. I, I won't get into the personal aspects of it, but um, my life fell apart. And, and this was right around the time I was doing those film trailers. I was getting asked all the time to submit trailers. And I, I was getting so close to that and life on the personal front was falling apart. It, long story short, my, my first marriage um, ended and it, it ended dismally. And it was just a very, very dysfunctional several years. And it was so painful, I couldn't write. All my creativity was gone. And I just thought, you know what? I'm gonna have to get uh, another job. Um, but all that to say, I had to put everything on hold for several years. And uh, on the other side of it, when I came out of it, um, got remarried several years later, found an amazing girl who has just utterly turned my life around. I mean, she's an amazing, amazing person. And so all of a sudden I found myself being creative again and all the, the stars aligned, so to speak, to where I felt like, wow, all of a sudden I'm writing stuff that I never would have written before had I not gone through that really tough stuff. And so, I, you know, as you know, that whole album is instrumental. There's not a word on it. But there's, there's parts of that album I feel like are my life story set to music. Hopefully you can hear that there's some pain in there 
and there's also triumph. Um, and I just thought that was the that was the thing to do. Okay, now I'm ready finally to tell this story, but I did I just didn't have the material. And so, you know, on the creative side, there's that. And then on the practical side, there was the aspect of, well, before that, you know, Kickstarter was not around. There was no way I could have made that record until mm. the crowdfunding idea came along. So it just, it was the right thing for the right time. And the, uh, the other thing is because I hadn't done any film scoring in several years, still thinking that I might want to, I realized I'm gonna have to do an album as a business card, essentially. Here's an album of, of, you know, 12 different songs or whatever you want to call it that, you know, it, they're, they're each slightly different in terms of style and approach. And so it ended up being a business card, basically. It was a way to, first of all, uh, check off a, a bucket list item, a, a dream that I always wanted to accomplish. But there, the practical side of it was this is a demo. It's a demo reel of my, you know, scoring ability. And, um, you talked about the samples versus, you know, real orchestra. I don't know what the percentage is, but the majority of what you hear on that record is samples. I programmed oh, the entire go. thing. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, there's no getting around. You've got to have real human beings to get that kind of string stuff. But it's all, the string section was really small. It was a, tw I think it was 22 players. Um, but I stacked it three or four times. And mm. then I also, you know, the foundation of it is all samples. So it was, uh, you know, to make it sound big and epic. So the movement, you know, the stuff in between notes that it requires human beings to, to accomplish, that's real. But like all the big brass stuff and woodwinds and percussion, that's all programmed. Um, the, the rhythm section is all live. I mean, so it's a, it's a good mix. The, the drummer, the bass player, um, some of the guitars, uh, I actually played some of the guitars. I'm not a guitar player at all, but you know, I knew exactly what I wanted. So some of it was overdubbing one chord of, at a time <laughs> and you know, piecing it together. Um, oh. So I taught myself enough to just be able to get a solo down or whatever, but uh, yeah, it was a blast to do that project. And I'm hoping to, to follow it up you know, sooner than later. And, uh, but yeah, it was, it was a way to just do something I had always dreamed of doing, and, and uh, so yeah. It, it um, in in 2020 you released another album, Equinox, and to, to my ear, having listened to to both, Adulta feels like a, a really a, a bombastic, extroverted, um, as you said, a telling of a, of a life story and and mm -hmm. triumph and pain and and those highs and lows that go with it. Yeah. Equinox sounds to me to be quite a bit more introspective. Yeah, and uh, maybe more of the the introvert album, if you like. I'm really interested in the the approach from a creative point of view uh, that you took towards that album, but also from a business point of view, because I I believe you've offered that for physical sale rather than via streaming services. Uh, well, here's the funny thing: until you mention it, I tend to forget about that whole project, um, probably because. A large portion of it is just musical scraps that I had sitting around. Uh, you mentioned Spitfire a little bit ago. It's funny thing is I had downloaded all their uh, Spitfire Labs pianos and they're so quirky and, and organic and they've got a bunch of noises in them. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day I had just done some listening to, um, I forget who the artist was, a friend of mine on Instagram, I think his name is Tony Anderson. Mm -hmm. um he he did a, a similar project and i thought you know what i've got a ton of that kind of stuff sitting around just these little piano improvisations and so probably half of it was already done uh, or at least you know in some form and i just i'm a big believer in um seasonal music like in, in the fall over here or up here um everything you know gets very quiet and introspect it's just an introspective time of year it gets yeah. dark early and and i tend to write it, it differently it when it's like that you know and so um between going through my hard drive and finding all these little ideas i thought you know what why not just take an hour a day after i'm done with everything else and just improvise and 
in a month's time, I'll probably have a, a record I could put out. So that's what I did. Um, yeah, cool. The first half of it was just finishing a couple ideas that I had already sitting around. And then the rest, I decided to not even, not edit, you know, just shut my eyes, play and see what happens. And um, other than, you know, fixing a bad note here and there, uh, it's all just stuff that stream of consciousness, you know, um, taking a few minutes and just doing it. And um, it's actually opposite though, as far as physical versus digital, uh, Equinox is, it's only digital. Um, at Alta, I had done physical products uh, for that one, but Equinox is purely just on my website and, gotcha. uh, you know, all the streaming services. But yeah, it was, that was a fun project because it, it was something I didn't really expect to do. And it, it honestly just kind of came out of nowhere. Um, I just, you know, I was looking through my ideas folder at one, one point and I thought, you know what, I've got enough here. I could probably just put out some, and like you said, the idea, it's so opposite of Ad Alta, you know, where Ad Alta is big and bombastic and, mm. and cinematic. This is completely the other direction, you know, just very quiet and contemplative and, you know, music to stare at a fireplace by. <laughs> yeah, it makes a nice contrast, I think. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, no, very nice indeed. And so now we're going to get to, for, for some of our watchers um, who will have been looking at those wonderful flashing lights in the background, uh, Jim, so let's talk a little bit about your rig. And obviously there'll be the rig you, you have with Michael and then what you use at home. But mm. let's just talk about the Michael rig at this stage. What, what, what is your default rig that you use? So it's, it's funny you ask. I actually, uh, people have been asking me to do a, a rig video for years and I should have done it a long time ago because now it's not interesting at all. It's just a controller and a laptop. <laughs> um, but on my YouTube channel, uh, I did do one back in fall and it, it does, I think it's interesting it's in some ways. It talks about um, the main stage aspect and you know the, just the physicality of it. I, I'm a big proponent of... Um, you know, how it looks. I want it to look stage worthy. And um, so I actually did some cool industrial stuff. I found a, a hydraulic lift and it's, it's got a cool look. You'll have to go to my YouTube channel to find it. But the long and short of it is uh, this past fall, I was going to do a, a video from one of my software collections based on the Yamaha DX7. And I thought it would be fun to recall Michael's old keyboard rig, which is the uh, Yamaha KX88, the old you know, controller. And so I put out some feelers on Facebook and I asked some of my friends, does anybody have a KX88 I could borrow that's in good shape, strictly to do a video? And a friend of mine uh, emailed me, he said, I have one in mint shape. I will send it to you if you pay for shipping and you can have it. And I, I thought, wow. So, so he sent me a KX88, costs a, a pretty fair bit to ship it because it's extremely heavy, but it showed up uh, just in time for our rehearsals for the fall tour. And I fell in love with that thing. It, it's um, to this day, it's still one of the best feeling 88 key controllers I've ever played. It, there's just something about it. And, um, and it looks fantastic. And I just thought there's something fun about bringing out a 35 year old workhorse. And, and because we were doing a lot of Michael's um, throwback material from the eighties. I just thought, you know what, I'm going to completely recreate the look of his keyboard rig from those early tours, which was a KX 88. Um, and that's it on, on this really cool looking stand. So that's what I did all through the last three months. And, um, on the software side, uh, all of my sounds come from main stage. I, I built this kind of elaborate system called backstage pass for main stage and it's all custom sounds that I've sampled over the years from, from hardware keyboards. And uh, that is the exclusive, you know, um, place where I get all my sounds from. I don't use any keyboards anymore that have sounds in them. Some guys will ask, don't you have something for backup? And I don't, because if you, if you take the time to really dial it in, right. Um, and I've talked, I talk about this in that video walkthrough that I just did a few weeks ago. It's, it's rock solid. It's just as solid as any keyboard. And, um, and it's the, you know, it sounds fantastic. If you, you, know, you take the time to really dial everything in, um, you know, it's, 
I love it. it. It gives me the flexibility of being able to get any sound I can dream of, which you could never do with a hardware keyboard because um, every keyboard's got limitations. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically it as far as the road rig. That's brilliant. And then, so obviously behind you there, Jim, uh, and I was having a look, so I can obviously work out the DX70. I assume that's is it a Matrix Brute? Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to, I can't try yeah, to yeah. So, yeah, Matrix Brute, uh, Roland System 8, and then below that is a Hydrosynth. And then on that side, let's see, Roland D50, DX7 Mark II, the original DX7, and then below that is an Ensonic VFX. And then um, nice. and there's the other side that you can't see, but that's my 80s wall back there. Uh, beautiful that funny story when i was probably 15 years old there was a music store that i would go into my my i would go to the mall with my mom and uh she would drop me off and i would disappear for hours into this music store and it was one of those music stores where the front was all like the home organs and keyboards which completely uncool but in the back you know it was like this inner sanctum it was dark and and uh there, it was walled off but that's where all the long haired, you know, musicians would hang out. And it was all Yamaha DX stuff. And I would just obsess about that stuff. And that was basically what, uh, what that looked like. It was a, a big rack with all the, you know, the DX7 stuff. So to this day, I walk in my studio and I see that. And I think my inner 15 year old would be very happy. <laughs> that's right. And you're a similar age to us, Jim. So yeah, the DX7 had a similar impact, I think, on us. And then the D50, although I was yeah. sort of 18 by that stage, that was another groundbreaker again. Yeah. D50 to this day, it I've got a bunch of um, custom patches in mine and certainly the factory sounds, everybody's heard them. But that thing can still do some sounds that nothing else can touch. It pads and atmospheres and... And the sound of it, it physically, I mean, you know, sonically, it's it's big and wide and it's got a lot of bottom end. And I record it through like a, a stereo pair of Neve preamps. It just sounds fantastic. So I'm never letting that one go. <laughs> no, nor should you. No, great stuff. Yeah. Um, and we will be talking more about rig stuff and, and backstage pass in, in our bonus episode. So yeah, looking forward to that as well. Cool. Yes, yeah, so um, we're coming up into some standard questions that we ask all our guests, Jim. And the first one is, with all your years of experience uh, playing, music directing, composing, what are key lessons you might pass on to other players or other musicians based on what you've learned? The first, you know, I wish I had a dollar for every time somebody asked you know, especially young guys, how do you get started doing this? How do you, you know, there's no answer. There's no good answer that I know of anyway. But the one thing I always tell people is learn to listen. Um, listen to music you love and try and pick it apart. It, it, first musically, but also sonically. You know, I think one of the reasons I'm good at what I do is because I've developed a really good ear. Um, you know, and it's funny because the way I grew up, I was the only one in my family who was really musical. So there wasn't much variety in the house as far as music. I would just, you know, I'd hear stuff on pop radio, uh, like I said earlier. But when I moved to Nashville, um, I felt like a late bloomer because, you know, all my musical friends, they grew up you know, on the Beatles or, you know, whatever, all this stuff. I never heard any of that stuff until I was 22 years old. So when I started, you know, getting a paycheck, I would take a pretty big chunk of it and I'd go to the record store and I'd come home with a stack of CDs and that period from you know that was 1995 through well from then on mm -hmm. um excuse me I would just absorb myself in listening to to all kinds of stuff whether it was film music um or you know again pop stuff and I, that's when I really started to hear what makes things work? Why do I like the sound of this so much? How did they get it, the DX7, for example? It's a great example of um, a keyboard that when I finally got one in 1989 or so, I thought this thing is terrible. It's mono. It 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 doesn't have any built-in effects. You know, when you listen to the D50, it sounds radio ready out of the box. It was you know one of the first keyboards that had built-in effects. It sounded amazing. So I get a DX7. I'm like, well, I 
this kind of sounds like what I heard all through the middle eight middle eighties, but something's missing. You know, it sounds, it's noisy, it's mono. It, and that's when you start figuring out, okay, well, there's a whole other bunch of factors to why these things sounded the way they did. The mm -hmm. Roland Dimension D chorus, uh, analog tape, you know, a good preamp, um, AMS reverb. That was a huge ingredient in, in pop music in the eighties. So it was listening that, that, really was my biggest teacher. Um, I was also a huge fan of Keyboard Magazine. Um, I had a library of every uh, issue that came out. When Keyboard Magazine would show up at once a month, that's the first thing I would do. I'd, I'd spend an hour reading every page. And that was my education. Um, I didn't learn a thing in college, but I learned a ton from Keyboard Magazine. And I, I honestly feel like I owe those guys a, a debt of gratitude. And I've gotten to know some of the, the writers from back then. And um, but yeah, you know, listening and, and these days, I think watching stuff like what you guys are doing. Um, I'm not a podcast guy. I just, it, you know, when I get in the car, I'm, I'm listening to other music. But um, a lot of guys like podcasts. Um, I've really gotten into YouTube the last two years or so. I'll, I try not to let it take up too much time, but um, you know, that's how we do gear reviews these days. It used to be that Keyboard Magazine would show up and you'd, you'd read every page to find mm -hmm. out, okay, they're reviewing the Roland D50 this month, you know, and that was the big, that's how you learned everything. Now, you know, uh, you hear about a keyboard and what do you do? You go to YouTube and you, you watch every review you can find. And um, so that's a, that's a big part of it, you know, just keeping your ear to the ground figuring out what, what people are doing and, and just, um, yeah, I, I think listening, that's yeah. one of the biggest things. I think that's, that's, that's a great piece of advice. Um, and just in regards to other players, Jim, do you have a bucket list or other people you've always thought if the opportunity arose, I would love to work with them or, or even other projects that you're passionate about developing? Yes, absolutely. Um, well, certainly as a keyboard player, uh, and a lover of all things 80s. Um, you name just about any artist from the 80s, I would jump at the chance. At the top of the list, Phil Collins and Genesis. Absolute favorite. I mean, those guys, um, that is a huge part of the soundtrack of my life. And so there's something, kind of like I was talking about with Michael's music, same thing with Phil Collins. His songwriting, there's just something about it. Uh, him and Tony Banks, their chord progressions, so unique. And it's, it's just like it, it resonates with me. And um, so I would love to work with those guys. Um, gosh, you name it. Simple Minds, Tears for Fears. Um, a big David Foster fan. Uh, in fact, I was just talking with um, Jason Sheff the other day, lead singer of Chicago since I think he came on in Chicago 18. Um, he just bought my software stuff last week. And so he got in touch and talk about a, that made my day because like you know lead singer of a band who i loved in that time period any of those keyboard artists bruce hornsby huge fan of bruce hornsby and there's a lot of his playing i think that has influenced mine um who else um toto oh my gosh i'd kill to play with toto uh love 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 their stuff any of that any of that kind of stuff you know, it's a hell of a bucket um, list, Jim. You need to get onto that. That's hell of a bucket <laughs> well, list. you know, it's it's funny you ask because I, I, I'm actually brewing an idea that I probably shouldn't talk about because I don't want anybody to steal it. But it, it's um, it involves a lot of those 80s artists. And if I can pull it off, it's I think it's the ultimate bucket list. So stay tuned because I'm I'm I'm, I'm it's probably gonna be later this year until I can do some fishing and see if I can make it happen. But um it would be epic it, and, and it's something that I'm really, really dreaming about. So. We'll, we'll keep our ear out for that because uh, <laughs> David and I are massive fans of the eighties as, as David yeah. mentioned earlier. I think, I think we're yeah. contemporaries of yours. So we're, we're, we're excited for anything like that. Trust me. Yeah. I think it would be, if I could do it, man, I, I think it would be huge. So we'll yeah. see. Yeah. Cool. We'll see. Good luck with that. Uh, we'll, yeah, we'll, thank keep, you. we'll keep our eyes and ears open, Jim. Yeah. Now, years of years of playing live in some some of the biggest concerts going around. I'm I'm confident you have an excellent or memorable train wreck story for us. 
It's funny. I really don't. People ask that a lot. And um, I mean, there's certainly been things along the way, but I can, I can never remember any. I mean, <laughs> there were, okay, here's one. Back in the days before, I'm trying to remember how to explain this. Here's what it was. We were playing in Brazil. And so it was a fly date. We didn't have our usual gear and it was a stadium show. So it was a hundred thousand people. And um, we, had, for whatever reason, I don't remember why, we had to put all our background stems and click in, on Tascam DA88 tapes, uh, you know, compared to the ADAT. Mm -hmm. And man, that's asking for trouble because, you know, for one thing, you're locked into to tape. You, you can't jump around like you can with a computer. So the whole show was laid out and, you know, you're, I could start and stop, <laughs> excuse me, but boy, if you had to locate to, to the next song or the pre, whatever, you, you were toast. Yep. And um, there was something about that show. I don't remember. If this was somewhere around 1997, I think. I think I had located to the next song. And when I hit play, we always have a two bar count off. The first bar is just quarter notes. And the second bar has eighth note shakers. So you know that it's the second, it's the, the count in bar. Yep. And I think it started maybe a beat too late. So what we thought was the first beat was actually the second, something like that. And um, so that was, that was one thing. We thankfully we recovered pretty quickly, but um, something happened. I think the tape dropped out or whatever. And so we're just flying blind, but Hey, the upside is Michael hires great players. So you know, I don't think the audience ever probably knew about it, but we yeah. sure did. And the other one that I, that always sticks out to me is we were playing a, a festival in Pennsylvania. Um, and it's a festival I always went to as a kid. It's called Creation. And there's usually about 80,000 kids. And it's where I'd always seen, you know, all these big acts play. And um, so it was the first time that we were back there since I had started playing for Michael. I think this would have been around 1997 as well. And out front, they were using Yamaha O2R digital consoles. And it was a hot, humid festival date and the, the consoles locked up. And uh, so we're starting and Michael's headlining and it's supposed to be huge. My parents are there. <laughs> and the only thing on out front was Michael's vocal and the hi-hat, <laughs> nothing else. So it was, the, it was like Spinal Tap. It was the most anticlimactic thing you can imagine. We're just playing away. And on stage, it sounded huge because th this was before in-ear monitors. So we had these you know, big wedges and, and side fills. So it was loud on stage. We had no idea. So we're kind of giving it everything we had. And unbeknownst to us, there was nothing on out front and and so it was a disaster after the show of course i see my parents and my mom says well it sounded great to us i'm like mom <laughs> it, it didn't sound great there's nothing on out front so typical mom she you know she was proud and, and she loved it but it was maybe she thought you were virtuoso hi-hat player jim maybe that's what <laughs> It must have been. It must have been. But it, those are the only two that I can really remember that that were real train wrecks, you know. And it's at big moments when you really want it to be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're, they're excellent ones, all the same. So yeah, well yeah. done. Yeah. Um, and the other one we we do regularly is we ask um, our guests to tag other keyboard players they would love to hear interviewed. So any uh, fellow players that you go, I'd love to hear more about their life story. Oh man, well. Tony Banks, probably because yes. I've been listening to a lot of Genesis. If you haven't interviewed Tony, um, those other uh, Bruce Hornsby is a good one. Um, hey, I might be able to get Michael an interview with you if you like. Um, yeah, your readers might too. might like to hear him. Um, but who would I like to hear? I mean, yeah, Tony, um, Bruce Hornsby. He, he I, I, he's a fantastic, fantastic musician. Uh, I'm drawing a blank at the moment. No, they're, but... they're two good ones. And you'll be interested to know, we've tried with both Tony and Bruce, but we haven't had any luck as yet. But as you as you know, from your experience, getting through via management yeah. can be quite yeah. challenging. So. Sure, sure. 
yeah. Good picks. Yeah. And and moving on to our, our final question before we, we move into our bonus content around backstage pass, which I'm really looking forward to. What are five albums, discs, your desert island discs that you would just could not live without? Ooh, boy, how do you narrow that down? Yeah, exactly. Hard um, question. Yeah, I'll say. Uh, gosh, let me think. <laughs> I might have to cheat and pull up iTunes. Um, That's fine. I, I would say Invisible Touch, Genesis. Mm -hmm. um, Sm Smitty's or Michael W's uh, Eye to Eye record, which was really, really different for him let's see that's two uh <laughs> uh any john williams score probably probably the star wars score um thank uh, you uh mr mister i forget the name of the record but the, i know the one you mean yeah you know which one i mean yeah um and let me think something else from the 80s uh, gosh, if you name one, I could probably give you my stamp. Or, or yes, yes, there'd have to be a Phil Collins in there, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which one? Though? I, I always, I'm terrible about remembering album names. I remember. Yeah, songs I'm just before. trying. To, I, I feel terrible too. The one with the studio and everything on it, I can't even think of. Yeah, I, I, no, no jacket required. No jacket required. Yeah. Yeah. You know what else? One. I can't remember which record it is, but they're going back to the listening thing. There's. I've got these incredible pmc monitors which it's one of the things i i sold everything that wasn't nailed down a few years back because once i heard them i was like i've got to have these monitors they were extremely expensive though but one of the first things i listened to was phil's song i don't care anymore hmm. it starts with toms and you know hugh padgham the way he recorded those toms you go back and read about that it's it's just drums in a room and I mean, it was done in what, 1980, 1981, something like that. It's one of the best sounding recordings I've ever heard. And when you crank it up on these monitors, it's a religious experience. Yeah. And then, you know, you hear the Prophet 5 come in with the pad and, and it's, it's very sparse in terms of production. But good night. It is absolutely mind blowing to hear that track even today. It just stands up. So, yeah, probably that record. Good calls. Jim, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. You've had an amazing career with lots, obviously lots, lots more to go. You're only young like us. So um, there's <laughs> many, it. many more years of, of work left for you. So no, we really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. I, it's good to be here. I appreciate it. Well, that uh, chat delivered on everything I thought it would, Paul. Yeah, wasn't that great? And I know you say this every time and, and I always think that aren't keyboard players nice people? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still looking for that bastard. I'm still yeah, looking for um, them. And yeah. I mean, bastard in an all encompassing gender viewpoint. We just need a bastard. Yeah. Well, yeah, we need one of those real cringe interviews. Like when was it Michael Parkinson interviewed Meg Ryan? Where, oh, um, yeah. We just got nothing out of her and she was really hostile. So I'm sure that'll come, but maybe we need to start interviewing, I don't know, not keyboard players. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, now you're opening up a can of words. So, would it be drummers? No, it'd be lead singers and guitarists. Yeah, probably. But you know, you know, we, we've all we've all played, and you know, listeners and viewers, you play with various personality types. You know, the sort of people I'm talking about. But keyboard players, without fail, are wonderful ladies and gentlemen. They are absolutely. So, yeah. Look, thank you again uh, for for joining us, um, everyone. We'll be back again in a fortnight or so. But as always, we love to hear from you, particularly, as I've said uh, prior, you know, feedback on, on the new format. Um, our website is www.keyboardchronicles.com. Uh, we're on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash keyboard chronicles and on Twitter at the keyboard CHR1. If you like good old fashioned email, then we're always keen to hear from you at editor at keyboardchronicles.com. Um, as Paul has mentioned, we do have a Patreon account and that's where you'll be able to hear the bonus 
content where we talked to Jim, for example, about his backstage past software, what he went through to develop that and what his plans are for the future. Um, and for basically two bucks a month, you can help us go from strength to strength and hear even more um, interesting um, insights from some great players around the world. Paul, as always, thanks for jumping in. Oh, it's been a pleasure, David. Thank you for inviting me along once again. And also, as always, most importantly, thanks to you all out there for, for listening and we'll see you back here next episode.